What was your reaction to uh, to Elon becoming not only a passive investor, but now a seemingly very active investor who's on the board? I think it's interesting. I'm very impressed with what Elon has done in the world and his approach to PR and tweeting and everything else. Hope you go to Mars someday. <laughs> I have, is he good for Twitter? I don't know. It'll make the board meetings more interesting. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is Ev Williams, co-founder of Twitter and its former chairman and CEO. We talked about Twitter's earliest days, why he pivoted to a platform for long-form writing, and what he thinks about Twitter's evolution, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I also asked him about two men who have shaped Twitter more than any other. Elon Musk, who as of this week is Twitter's largest shareholder and newest board member, and of course, Donald Trump. Here's Ev Williams. Ev Williams, welcome to Offline. Thanks for having me. So uh, this is a show about all the ways the internet is breaking our brains, and just about every episode uh, inevitably includes a discussion about Twitter, uh, probably because I'm a longtime addict being in media and politics. Uh, I certainly won't make you answer for all the platform sins. I know you're not there anymore, but I'd love to talk about how we got to this point and where we might go from here, which I know you thought a lot about. And I guess my first question is, when, when you guys created Twitter... What was the what was the dream? What were your greatest hopes for the platform? Uh, gosh, I think in the early days of these things, you don't necessarily uh, construct a grand dream. Um, mm-hmm. It sort of unfolds over time, and so you know, Twitter was was very iterative, and uh, whenever you create something that that's that seems to be bigger than you initially planned, then your ideas for it expand. So at some point, we may have imagined, you know, world leaders and global politics playing out, but we certainly didn't think that in the beginning. In the beginning, we thought this is a fun way to stay in touch with friends, to, to, and we thought a lot in terms of it being an information network. And we use the term real time a lot in the beginning because that was what was unique about Twitter it was it was really pre-mobile or at least pre pre-smartphone and the idea of getting a notification or a message about something happening right now was interesting and we thought there were social uses of that that we observed just in our own use of like oh it's fun to to hear what your friends doing right now that was novel and cool and then there was utility and we would talk about things like, oh, there's an earthquake and we just felt the earthquake or there's, there's a fire or there's emergency. And, and so, and that, that seemed enough on its own and that seemed worth, worth developing. We, I mean, no one, I think could claim that they, they knew <laughs> what it would evolve to. That's interesting. It seems like the immediacy of Twitter was on your minds uh, early on, um, which is interesting because, you know, it ends up becoming a place for news where every journalist yeah. in the world is on. Uh, so it does seem like even from those early days, there was a thought that this could be used for news, even if you didn't think maybe like the professional media industry. Yeah. Although um, it became clear to me when I was still running the company, I, I remember probably the last big strategy presentation I gave to the company in 2010 was to define Twitter as a news platform. And um, I think that <laughs> people didn't fully buy it internally at the time. Like news, news, sat, like you mean like like the New York Times or like reporters? And I was defining our our view. And later, I think Dick and other people took up this this idea that Twitter really is a news platform. It's about things that are happening right now. It's about things that are new. It's about public announcements. Um, And that's, it's also a social network, which we shied away from in the early days, even that it was a social network. But it, it was clear at that time, that was 12 years ago, last time as CEO, um, to me then that it was news. It had evolved to be news. I saw that as it's, it's best purpose to, 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 be a a broadcast service really why did you guys want to shy away from describing it as a social platform it seems so obvious now that it's a social platform well i think i think we probably had a narrower idea of social in the early days at least i did and 
Um, also, it was to differentiate ourselves from Facebook, and you don't want to, you don't want to claim to be the thing that there's there's a giant, uh, you know, ten times your size, are already in that. You know, you want to you want to be different a little bit. But also, what interested me, and this has always been true, the internet isn't necessarily the social aspect. I didn't. To me, it was like social meant. Oh, we're hanging out, we're having fun. It's it's about. Um, connection which is great i'm all, all for connection but especially at the time i'm probably more interested in that now than i was then at the time i i kind of saw that as like well that's that's interesting to to teenagers but let's talk about you know knowledge and information and ideas that's that's really what we're trying to enable and and that goes back to the the very early design i mean twitter I think invented the word follow in, in the context of online systems and um, meaning like I can be interested in what you're saying, whether or not I know you and you don't have to be interested in what I'm saying. Publish subscribe model is, is what other people have called that. It existed obviously with, with email and traditional media and blogs with RSS. Uh, but we, we thought about that a lot in the very early days. Like we want to create a different sort of network here, a different sort of structure that enables more than just friends chatting amongst themselves. Can you talk about some of the early design decisions that went into that initial intent? Like, what was the original purpose of retweets? Why did you include favorites, which then become likes? Uh, why 140 mm-hmm. characters, et cetera? Uh, sure. I mean, they all, they all have their story. And, and somewhat famously, Twitter evolved in response to, to what people did with it. Um, the 140 characters came from the idea very, very early that it was, it was a text message platform, text messages in the early days. And this is 2006. So text messages in the U S were limited to 140 characters because of some obscure telecommunications hack. It was Jack and other members of the team that, that said, Hey, we could, we could create, use this to do something on mobile, which was very hard at the time. Be- before smartphones, doing applications for mobile were hard to build. There's no dominant platform. They didn't work very well. And so text messaging seemed like this clever hack to have something that was mobile and text messages were limited. So that was the whole idea. That was why it was 140 characters. Um, you know, the other things would kind of just figured out as we went there was actually a friend model in the very early version where you would um similar to well friendster was probably more a model or myspace is our model um we didn't even facebook existed when we were creating twitter but we weren't on it Mm because we were we were too old we were we were in (laughs) college we'd kind of heard about it i was like ah that's that doesn't sound like a thing uh we're doing we're doing serious work here with this twitter and uh so, so we had the friend model, but that was like, uh, that seems complicated. It's like you could friend and follow or something. We maybe had different words, friend, subscribe. This is very, very early. And then um, retweet came a few years later. It wasn't until I think 2009 hmm. that we actually built that into the product. That was the, uh, users had started retweeting. Replies were another thing that was a response to users. Now you know, and app mentions hashtags, all these things kind of people people started doing, and then we created a native version of them. Was there a moment when you realized that Twitter had gone from like a, a fun place to share random thoughts and information to basically an indispensable platform for media and politics? Again, it evolved. There was no one moment. There were there were things that happened very early on that made us go, whoa, what did, what did we create here? I think one of the big ones was um, we got word that the protesters in Egypt were using the platform to communicate in real time. Mm-hmm. And, During the Arab uh, Spring. Uh, yeah. Even, even prior to that, I believe. Um, and there, there was a, a gentleman whose name I'm forgetting, that, but we talk about all the time. He was from Berkeley, and he had been in Egypt, and and actually gotten put in. He got, got arrested at a protest and put in jail, and he tweeted, and his followers maybe helped get him out. He came to the office and spoke, and we're like, "Whoa, this is this is interesting." Um, although 
perhaps not totally surprising to some people on the team, some of the early engineers actually knew about how to program for SMS and had built systems um, for activism. So there, there was some roots of that early on, but then, you know, things just kept, kept happening. Every time something would happen in the world, it would happen on Twitter and then in new, new people would sign up and um, just for, for a tiny startup that's trying to make something, it, there was a period where just mind blowing things would happen. Like the, the, the race to a million followers between CNN and Ashton Kutcher um, <laughs> was very bizarre. And I, I was uh, invited to go on Oprah, which was also bizarre. And on the TV, like the night before I'm in the hotel room and Anderson Cooper is, is telling people to go follow CNN on Twitter. Of course, it, this, this is 2009, April 2009, I think. Hardly anyone knows what Twitter is, but but here I have this, um, you know, broadcasting basically an ad for us because CNN wanted to beat Ashton to a million followers. And so those things, it was just like, you can't make this stuff up. And um, and then there's the Arab Spring and then, you know, and on and on and on. C- CNN and Ashton Kutcher competing to see who could get a million followers first really seems like a foreshadowing to where we've all ended up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, doesn't it? I, yeah. I, I joined Twitter in, in 2010 while I was in the White House. Uh, and in those days, the press office didn't want the rest of the staff tweeting. So I was just on it for, for news. I thought it was also pretty fun. I still thought it was fun by the time I was tweeting myself when I left the White House in 2013. Though even then, it was it was starting to feel a little snarkier and nastier by then. And we had gone through the reelect campaign. And in 2012, it was like that a little bit as well. When did you notice that this indispensable platform you helped build might be causing more harm than, than you guys might have intended. What I thought you were going to say is more harm than good. No, I wasn't going to go there yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Obviously, um, no, because I, I felt this point too. I like, I love Twitter at first and, you know, I mean, I'm still on it. Right. So that's, that tells you everything you need to know. But there was a moment where suddenly, and I don't remember exactly when it was, but I was just like, wow, this has gotten really nasty. Like this is not, the tone is different. It seems angrier, nastier, snarkier, like, and I'm, I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. When do you think that happened and why? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm not sure if I have a, a good timeline for that. I know there were complaints early on that we probably should have taken more seriously about um, you know harassment or abuse. We weren't totally laissez-faire. We thought deeply about these things. And I, I think some of the early members of the team Fortunately, we, we'd had some experience with open platforms and uh, undesirable behavior because some of the team was worked on Blogger with me at Google. Mm-hmm. And so that was an early UGC platform that um, ran into some of these dilemmas about whether it's political or, or um, abusive content or misinformation. And so... We were very thoughtful about these things, but it wasn't, we didn't anticipate, at least I didn't, that this was going to be a major, major thing for the history of of Twitter, just because of the nature of it, enabling very free form, very low friction communication also meant um, lots of negativity. And and you combine that with the state of media and the state of the world, I think it's, it's part of an ecosystem where where everyone's more divided, it, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I think that probably Trump 2016 was a turning point, as as was Trump's removal from Twitter. I mean, then things just got intense, I think. Yeah. No, I do think the 2016 campaign is when it all kind of went to hell. Which, But, I mean, th- there's this long-running debate with, about, you know, how much of this, and, and this is not just true of Twitter, but all platforms, how much of what goes on there is just human nature taking place online and how much of it is platform design? You, you wrote in 2018 uh, that one of the things we've seen in the past few years is that technology doesn't just accelerate and amplify human behavior. It creates feedback loops that can fundamentally change the nature of how people interact and societies move in ways that probably none of, none of us predicted. In what ways do you think Twitter specifically has changed the way we interact? What, what are some of the feedback loops there? I think 
I remember writing that, by the way, that sounds pretty smart. So um, <laughs> better, better writing than, than talking. Uh, well, just, just the fact that I, I think generally about media in general, there, there's a system on the internet where attention is rewarded, period. And that isn't, that isn't necessarily true in real space or in the history of human evolution. It was like it, attention um, could be very negative. Sometimes you really don't want attention and, and there's harm that will come from that if you get attention in the wrong way. Um, and, and then on, we created this virtual world where there's the benefits of attention and little downside of, of attention. Um, now, that's not entirely true. Anyone who's been the subject of a, a flame war or, or been canceled or, or anything else is like tweeted the wrong thing, said the wrong thing ever sees a lot of downside of, it, of attention. And one of the things computers do and these systems do is we measure attention. That's the main thing any of these systems do. And so I think that's a very um, fundamental thing is that um, if we get attention, people thrive off that and they figure out that, that one way to get attention is to stir people up. That, that's pretty basic. And, but beyond that, you could, you could say, well, does 140 characters or now 280 characters make that even worse? Because we can't have nuanced reason debates. The fact that it's so quick moving, um, you, you have to respond really quickly to get your word in or to, to play the game. That may um, that may affect it as well. Um, yeah, the retweet. I, I, <laughs> there's there's a guy who helped build the native retweet at Twitter who, and others I think who have said we should have never had the retweet without the the quote um, hmm. because um, misinformation spreads because it's so easy to to just hit the button and replicate that. And then I've other, seen others say. Um, the quote retweet is when you add, add context is the worst thing because people hit that and don't realize they're amplifying the original message that they may disagree with. Mm-hmm. We can get really geeky in the nuance of, of all that stuff, but um, all those things affect how people behave for sure. At least if you quote tweet, you have to think about what you're retweeting at that point and you have to add something to it so it does take a little extra step in your mind so you're not just like mindlessly hitting the button and spreading it so i might be on the might be on that side of that debate i mean i've always you can just dunk on them right it's an easy (laughs) way to to dunk on someone and say you know look at this yeah that's true look at this and so i don't know is that great (laughs) where versus you can hit the retweet and just like this is great. And like, it's an implied, this is great. If you don't yeah, see anything, anything. Well, as, as we know, retweets do not always uh, equate endorsements. <laughs> <laughs> Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. Blue Moon is truly one of a kind with its bold flavor, bright explosion of color, iconic orange slice ritual, and authentic roots being born in a ballpark. No matter where you are. <laughs> Cre- Creedence Clearwater Revival song. <laughs> Got it. Sorry, keep going. No matter where you are or who you're with, a Blue Moon guarantees a one of a kind beer experience every time. Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth, guys? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're delicious. I've been, I've been loving. I would like open. one right now. Me during too. An ad Every session. time I read these ads, I want a blue moon. The ads are working because yeah, you think about that really iconic orange slice and just, just seems so refreshing. You know, blue moon isn't the only brew that can brighten your life. Try blue moon moon haze, a hazy, juicy pale ale brewed with dried whole oranges for a brighter taste that's unmistakably blue moon. Or check out Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat and Tropical Wheat, two refreshingly light citrusy wheat beers, checking in at just 95 calories per 12 ounces. All are perfect for hanging out with friends at home or at the bar. Break away from the same old beer. Blue Moon Belgian White is one of a kind every time. Get Blue Moon Belgian White, Light Sky, and Moon Haze delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline. Blue Moon made brighter. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Offline is brought to you by Haya. Hey. Hey. Typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. The pediatrician-approved super-powered chewable vitamin sounds great. While most children's vitamins are filled with five grams of sugar and can contribute to a variety of health issues, Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk, yet it tastes great and is perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. 
formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. Haya is designed for kids of all ages and sent straight to your door so parents have one less thing to worry about. We've been giving some Haya to Charlie. How's it going? Fantastic. He thinks it's candy, even though it's good for you. So he likes that. He feels like it's a treat. Sounds like a win-win. Which is the ideal for a vitamin, because now he's getting all the nutrients he needs. Because maybe he's not getting them from just eating pasta and cheese all the time. I saw him rip a phone book in half. Yeah, that's that's what you get. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash offline. This deal is not available on their regular website. You got to go to H I Y A H E A L T H dot com slash offline and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Offline is brought to you by Blue Chew. Confidence can take you far in life. When you feel confident, you're at your best, especially when it comes time to step up to the plate. And for is men, a, is it about a baseball app? Here come the metaphors. That's baseball. where Blue Chew comes in. I was always so nervous when I played baseball. Give as a me kid. some. So this has some. What way would happen to you when you would start playing baseball? Well, you Why see, you I would. Um, I would uh, see the problem when I was playing baseball. Mm-hmm. I would sometimes um, get nervous about. I don't want to yeah, do okay. this. <laughs> okay, you try. You started. Well, I, I really was talking about baseball. You know, well, Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. Oh, that's what this is for. You didn't think that was about that, did you? But in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. This is different than the children's vitamin from before? Don't mix them up. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Guys. Good, good note. Can... <laughs> Fellas. You can take them, Fellas. You can take them anytime, Come day on. or night. You bet. So you can plan ahead. Day? What are you? What are you, Hugh Hefner? (laughs) (laughs) Or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. How about that? Uh, The process is simple. Yeah, I think we know what the process is. They said this day would never come. (laughs) (laughs) Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part? I mean, a couple of good parts, it seems like. It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in Tommy, a discreet package. Is this what you're putting in your smoothies every morning? <laughs> Which yeah. one was it? Is it this? Blend this thing up. Okay. Yeah. Pep with in my step. Blue, with Blue Chew, men can safely and easily get assistance without embarrassment or awkwardness. All that comes just in the reading of this <laughs> ad. So men, if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code CROOKED at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code CROOKED to receive your first month free. We're trying to give it away here. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, Blue Chew. (laughs) (laughs) I just thought one big problem is that you have a bunch of journalists breaking news on a platform that doesn't really allow for context, nuance, or a sense of proportion because of the character limit. So it's not, it's sort of the existence of journalism and media on there when, you know, the uh, the idea behind journalism is that you break news and tell stories with plenty of context so that the consumer really understands the story. And it's, it's harder to mm. do that on, on Twitter, I think. Yeah, there's also... Uh, I think a a negative feedback loop with journalists on Twitter who are writing for journalists or they're writing their stories wherever they're writing them and um, really responding to the Twitter conversation, which, you know, has, there, there's a certain culture, I would say, about journalists on, on Twitter that is um, you know, hard hard to ignore. If, you, if you're a journalist. And so um, what's I it seems to me that jur- the the peer respect or lack of of a journalist really has changed what what people publish and write about more so than their audience. Well, there's also a hive mind effect there, right? Like you're you That's are shaped, kind of what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're, you're shaped by the information that you consume. And so 
the the journalists who are on Twitter, which is most of them, like they are spending all day not only reporting their stories but reading the tweets of their fellow journalists. <laughs> yeah. And so and and because those those tweets aren't strictly news but opinion first analysis and now opinion about whatever and there's so much opinion on Twitter that sort of bleeds yeah. into the news coverage and there's the whole you know Twitter is not real life thing but part of that is journalists I think and I, you can't blame them for this because again this is their information environment they see what's happening on Twitter and maybe mistakenly believe that it represents broader public opinion when certainly it does not Absolutely. And the other thing is, it's just very hard to be positive. It's very hard to defend anything and say anything is good. And it's very easy to say things are bad. And so if you look why, at Why do you think like, that is? Do you think that's a, a more of a human nature, uh, you know, it bleeds, it leads thing with journalism? Or do you think that's the that's social media? I think it's partially humans. I mean, it's, it's, it's very unrisky to say something sucks yeah, <laughs> um, or something is not going to work or people, people are bad, but, but it drives journalism culture um, more because it's what's respected. I mean, there's a lot of values or speak truth to power and, and, you know, take, take down the man and all that, which is valuable and good. And if that's the highest value, it's very hard to say, actually this person over here is doing something pretty good or, you know, this is interesting. Maybe, maybe I'm optimistic about that. It just, it's very hard to get away from that. And it's like, I think that the part that's human nature is if you can see that in companies, you can see that in clicks, you could see that in high school. It's like if, if the dominant culture is eh, everything sucks, then, then that affects everybody. And maybe it's how we're wired. We're, we're more wired to be sensitive to negativity because survival, you know, whatever. So that's a that's a bummer, and I I think that's the the thing to remember. Remember though is, and this is very very important to the ethos of Twitter from day one. You can choose what you pay attention to, and that's a thing people forget. So we're talking about Twitter like it's one thing. It's not one thing. It's a million things. From very early on, we built in the ability to choose what you pay attention to, and I I think that's something sometimes people forget if they don't like the tone. Just like you can change your friend group, you can change you can change your timeline. Yes, that is that is very true. That is something that I have been trying to do as of late. Uh, unfollow certain people, mute certain people. Uh, every time Twitter tries to change uh, change something where they uh, the default is giving me the top tweets first, I change it back so that it's latest tweets because I don't want Twitter's mm -hmm. algorithm about the top tweets. Um, so my top the, tweets are great, by the way. Your top tweets top are great. Tweets. I think my top <laughs> tweets are like just the same shit that it's all the same. It's all the same political opinion that I always get. So I'm, that's that's why I try to um, avoid the top yeah. tweets. Um, yeah. One of the reasons I asked about the the character limit is because when you left Twitter in in, in 2011, uh, you ended up starting Medium, which is a digital publishing platform that allows people to write posts with as many characters as they want. To what extent did you view Medium as a response to uh, the shortcomings of, of, of Twitter and, and social media writ large? Honestly, it wasn't at all. It was, it was meant, and it's still meant to be a compliment. I, I wasn't trying to, to fix Twitter. What I, I was trying to take lessons from Twitter and really apply them to things I'd worked on before that, which was blogger mainly. And um, the way I thought about it was at, at blogger, we're making it easy to publish on the web. And, we thought everyone should have a website. Anyone who wants to share knowledge or ideas on the web, we're going to make that easy to do. That's a great benefit to society. What we didn't do, and a big miss at the time, was really creating a network amongst those people. And then Twitter was all network and Instagram and Facebook and all these other things where we really learned oh, the internet is for networks. That's really where the value comes from is where distribution, feedback, growth, defensibility, business potential comes from. But most of the internet, the longer form stuff, there's no network for. And so let's build a network for longer form stuff um, and it will be a better place to publish. That, that was really the whole idea. It was like a network publishing platform for more substantive content. Not to, not to say that's better. It's just 
clearly you can't say everything you want to say on Twitter. People, what people spend a lot of time doing on Twitter is linking to stuff that's longer, that's, that's written outside of Twitter. So we want to create a better environment for that stuff. And this was almost 10 years ago now. So um, I'd say publishing platforms in general on the web have gotten better, but even at that time, half the websites you, you could barely view on the phone. And so part of it was just, let's create a better environment design wise. And then secondly, because of the earlier point about if you can design systems, you can influence behavior. Um, really the aspirational goal of medium was to create an environment where good stuff floated to the top, where people weren't just rewarded for attention, where people re were rewarded for creating value. So that was core to our ethos very early on. And um, right today we're sub subscription-based, which is consistent with that. In the early days we weren't subscription-based, but we thought a ton about how do we how do we make sure that the same superficial click baby stuff doesn't doesn't bubble up here. Um, let's let's look at different types of metrics and tr really try to measure that, which is something we're still trying to do. It's a very hard problem, um, but uh, that was the motivation. I do think the subscription versus sort of paid advertising model, which I know you you thought about a ton and written about a ton and are working on this at Medium, sort of gets to the the crux of the whole issue here which is, you know, you were just talking earlier about attention as the driving force behind a lot of these platforms. Well, you know, the reason that it is is because the paid advertisers that many of these models depend on um, require attention. <laughs> and so you're trying to pe keep yeah. people on the platform longer. And it seems like it will always be difficult for a platform like Medium to compete so long as there are platforms like Twitter and Facebook that have really perfected the business of capturing our attention with just a constant stream of clickbaity content. It's it's like asking us to choose vegetables over dessert. <laughs> like, is that <laughs> is that fixable? What do you think about that 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 challenge? In some ways, it is asking us to choose vegetables, meaning in any effort to promote or enable high quality content. Um, I put high quality in air quotes for the, <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's, it's a tricky word. I, I, uh, one, one we debate a lot at medium, but, um, I think people generally get the idea. If that's your goal, are you, are you just, um, fighting an uphill battle that you'll inevitably lose against human nature? That I choose to be an optimist about that. Food diet is a good metaphor. I mean, the fact is we're driven to consume junk food if we just go by our base instincts and have um, no self-control. And some people do that, but a lot of people choose otherwise because they they have different goals. They realize how that makes them feel. And the same thing applies. If, if you consume junk content all day long, you, you don't feel great. You don't learn much. You don't reach your goals. Um, and so some people, at least part of the time, choose to eat a salad <laughs> instead of the fast food at lunch. And some people choose that a lot. And so what, what we've tried to do at Medium and what I've always said to people internally is like, there's enough of those people. But like, and those people should have a choice. Let's create something great for them. And let's create something great for the people who want to create that stuff. So, so it's not, and if you had a purely advertising driven world and by the way there's a nuance in particular about advertising for written content on the web that makes it very very hard to to support um thoughtful stuff that um let's create an option for that and maybe you know maybe that reaches 10 percent of people which would be many millions of people and that'd be great yeah i always wonder though like how much of it is individual willpower versus the incentives of these platforms and what it's doing to our brains like you know sometimes it's like cigarette smoking or uh or even like maybe a better analogy is like you know prescription drugs which is there is a good use for them but mm -hmm. they can be very addictive and then people become addicted to them and then it be go it goes beyond a question of individual willpower and i know you thought a lot about um fixing the internet writ large you know like I wonder if at some point the paid advertising model of so many of these social media platforms is just sort of 
rewiring our brain chemistry uh, in a way that is so focused on clickbait and, and garbage content that it's becoming harder and harder for people to make individual choices about where to focus their attention? I, I mean, to some degree, it's undoubtable. It's becoming harder. I mean, the, we, the epitome of the internet, I think, is <laughs> is TikTok. It's it's unbelievable, and, yeah. and it's it's brain candy like nothing has ever been in, invented, and it's seductive as hell. And everyone who's on TikTok feels that. Now, there's good stuff on TikTok. I, I, I've, I've spent time on TikTok. There's, there's everything you can imagine on yeah. TikTok, just like there is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, it's just generally shorter and uh, in portrait mode. And, but, but even if you're, if you're consuming that in, in large measure, um, it's a little, little exhausting and you can feel what it's doing to you, to your brain, just like you can feel if you consume too much stuff, that's, that's not great for your body. You can feel it's too much. And I just, I do worry a little bit about where that's taking us. And I have, I have two preteen kids. So we're on the verge of probably having a lot more of those discussions about TikTok or Instagram or these other things that are really more the epitome of that. But I, I still think people, people are going to learn that we're going to be just as we become more sophisticated about cigarettes or, or food there's a hell of a lot more intelligence and, and mindfulness about what we consume than there was when we were kids. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is, is like, we're, we're sort of in a earlier phase of the, the process food now process information. What is this really doing to us? We got to get, we're going to have to go through some pain and get more sophisticated about it over time. Uh, I want to ask your thoughts about Twitter today. First, was it hard to walk away from the board in 2019? Yeah, I thought about it a ton, and uh, I I ultimately did it. I was I was on the board for like twelve years, so um, it was it was hard. But ultimately, when I stepped down as CEO, I thought, well, I still want to be on the board because I feel uh, responsibility, and um, I feel like I can learn a lot. So if I can be helpful and helping as one voice on the board, which really doesn't have that much <laughs> sway, depending on who you are, um, <laughs> to, uh, and learn a lot. I mean, I, like, the company I, I, I helped start went public while I was on the board. I'd never been through that process. Um, you know, it got bigger and bigger. It was, you know, doing billions of dollars in revenue. That was a great, that was just a great opportunity to learn for me. And, and yeah, I had opinions that I, I wanted to have influence. And, and at, at that point in time, I thought, okay, it's um, the, the ROI of either my influence or my learning is less than maybe spending that time on different things. So um, it, once I realized that, it was fairly easy. What, in your view, are some of the most uh, beneficial changes that the company has made to the platform over the last few years? In the last few years, I think there have been more significant changes than in in like the ten years or whatever before that. You can look at um, two hundred and eighty characters. Sounds mm -hmm. like a, a small thing, but that yeah. was oh that that was kind of sacred for a long time. I think um, you know other stuff they've they've tried and they tried fleets. That's that seemed like a bad idea, and they got rid of fleets. But hey, they tried something. Um, spaces seems to be working great. I mean, they may have borrowed the idea, but um, you know, learn from Facebook. You don't have to invent all ideas yourself or, or any, really, <laughs> if you can execute them well. The big, big challenge for Twitter always, and this is a challenge for Medium, and is once you get a whole bunch of stuff, how do you connect people to the right stuff? I think that's underappreciated as, as a big challenge in Twitter and goes back to, well, if you don't like Twitter, there's a different Twitter for you. How do you, how do you figure out who to follow is a big problem on Twitter. Facebook didn't have this problem because it was just import your address book, find your friends. where did you go to school? Here are your friends. Twitter is like, we, we had this problem forever. It's like, what are you interested in? I'm in, you know, it could be your local roller derby team or, politician or you have like the or your profession 
And so they're making progress on that too. So with topic following and groups. And so I'm sure I'm forgetting some stuff, but, but the pace of, of change is, is better than it used to be. And that's a positive sign. The Twitter blue, and now they have a, a subscription product. Um, we'll see how that goes. Some of the, the crypto stuff they're integrating. I think it's, it's an exciting time. Offline is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Crooked Media started selling all of our cool shit, and today we're selling, we got t-shirts, we got hats, we got mugs. Some of them have Dan's face on them. Some of them have Dan's face on them. Uh, We sold a pool float briefly. Yeah, um, to to you know sweatshirts to virtue signal that you're vaccinated. Yeah, that worked out well. Yeah, because success is a million milestones on a, a forever milestones. evolving path. That Famously. was just a fragment of a sentence that I needed to say. We love how Shopify has the tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Huh? Reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is possibility powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash offline, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash offline right now. Shopify.com slash offline. Offline is brought to you by AG1. What if I told you you could get 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens in a single scoop of mythical green powder? I'd say it was impossible. You'd be wrong. Wow. Because we're talking about AG1 right now. One of Tommy's favorite products that we sell here Mm -hmm. at Crooked Media. Right? I've been on the AG1 train for years. And look at you. Choo choo. Choo choo choo. <laughs> Doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It's not like it's a shot of wheatgrass. It's got a mild tropical taste you're going to look forward to each morning. If you don't want the jitteriness of coffee. But and, who, still, and who does? Who does? Sometimes. Who does? But you still want that mental clarity and alertness. That's when you want your AG1. Recommended by professional athletes and with over 7,000 five star reviews, this is high nutritional value in its most convenient format. Health potions and power-ups don't exist in real life, but AG1 feels as close as you can get. It'll energize you, keep you regular, and taste great. That's important. It's also completely adaptable to your particular lifestyle. Keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. It's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills or supplements like your grandma used to take. Unnecessary. I like saying reclaim your health. Reclaim the health. Like a like a old piece of wood at Restoration Hardware that's yeah. now a table. Take it back, but it's like cheaper. Lu- like luggage, much cheaper. Like luggage you lost. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash cricket. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash cricket to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Have you listened to In the Bubble with Andy Slavitt yet? This comforting and informative podcast from Lemonada Media has been a source of nonpartisan and clear information for millions throughout the pandemic. Host Andy Slavitt served as the White House Senior Advisor for COVID Response and is here to help you make sense of tough scientific issues from COVID to climate. He's been called the Fred Rogers of the pandemic. Hear directly from Andy and his guests like Dr. Fauci, leading doctors, trusted experts, and many more as they tackle tough issues like what's next with the vaccine and booster rollout, how safe it is to travel, and what you need to know about COVID variants. Name one of the top podcasts of the year by Vanity Fair and many more. In the Bubble can keep you and your loved ones safe and calm. We love In the Bubble. Listen to it all the time. Andy's a friend of ours. He's great. New episodes out Mondays and Wednesdays. Listen to In the Bubble with Andy Slavitt from Lemonada Media wherever you get your podcast. Controversial question. Are you in favor of an edit button? (laughs) I'm actually not in favor of an edit button, although I'm not religious about it. It's weird to me that people are, (laughs) it's, it's, I don't know. I always, early on, I was like, nah, we don't need, we don't need that. It just delete it. It's short, whatever, correct it. And at the time early, it was like, it was an engineering challenge. I mean, we, we were, we were having trouble just making Twitter run. So 
and the way we had engineered everything was like edit would have been really really hard now i'm sure that the team could figure it out even though it's 100 times the scale just they're better than we were then but um I also don't think it's as bad as but like, oh, there's going to be all this, like people changing their tweet that was liked and you're endorsing. I was like, you know what? We figure out how to deal with those things. It's okay. That's what I worry. I worry about that with an edit button is that like, look, yeah. people want to edit button because everyone's making typos and then they're embarrassed because they're typos, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like it's a typo. I also think that people right. think deleting tweets is some big deal. Like if you deleted a tweet, oh, it's like, it was sacred. Yeah. Why did you delete it? Like just delete it. You made it a mistake. Delete yeah. the tweet. Um, but I do think, yeah, if you've retweeted or quote tweeted a tweet and all of a sudden someone completely changes it so that it says something else or more offensive or what a controversial, then suddenly it can cause all kinds of mischief, no? Unless I guess you can solve for that it in can, the design. It can cause mischief, but I mean, you think about it, okay, then, you know, do you use Slack? Yeah. Oh, yeah, at, you can at edit At first it. you couldn't edit Slacks and then you could only edit them if, if no one had replied to them yet or something. I don't know exactly how it worked. Now I noticed you can edit a Slack and guess right. what? It says edited there. And then, so if something looks fishy and it's, I'm sure Twitter All will do have this to say is like it was edited. edited. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see the old version? Maybe you can see the old version. This is actually something I wanted to do at media yeah. forever. And I still think is a good idea. This, the funny thing about digital publishing is like it can change. So tweets are, tweets are, you know, more like a statement or like can't necessarily change something you said, but published on the web, a funny thing about it is we still kind of treat it like paper. Like, mm -hmm. well, that's, that's what was published. And then, and there was a etiquette that was created with blogging early on, where if you change something, you needed to like put updated and what you changed in it. And, and it was sort of verboten to like, oh, I don't want to change this thing because I'm on the record. I'm like, well, that's kind of silly because why, why shouldn't you make a thing you've, you've written better and guess what? Computers can track these things. So, so why can't you just always make it better? And then you could mark, you know, this was updated. Maybe you could see the changes that were made over time. The Wikipedia does this, obviously, yeah. and people don't get upset about it. But most of all the other publishing uh, on the web, I think it should get better over time. Maybe that should be okay. It's probably less important for tweets than other types of publishing, but that's still something that we were sort of hung up about this this old idea on, I think. Yeah. There are a lot of recent reports about how Twitter executives want to decentralize the platform. What does that mean and, and what might it look like in practice? Oh gosh. Uh, that's a that's a hairy topic. <laughs> <laughs> um I don't know what they mean or what, what anyone's intentions are. And by the way, all my talking about Twitter, as you mentioned, I'm off, I'm off the board. I don't right. I don't, I don't have any inside track at Twitter anymore, which is, um, makes it much easier to talk about it than it mm. used to be. Um, <laughs> so you don't, have, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> you don't have to worry about It's fine. I can speculate like everybody else. Right. Um, so, I mean, generally these days when people say decentralized, it has to do with, with web three and the blockchain. Technically it doesn't have to, I mean, there's, there's been an effort that I think Jack started a few years ago, like called blue sky. Um, which was um, defined as an effort to, to decentralize Twitter. It's actually, if you look into what Blue Sky is doing, they're exploring all kinds of decentralization technologies that have been, many of which have been in the works for, for many years and don't necessarily have to do with the blockchain. So there's, there's Twitter-like services that are what they call federated. So... You could you could have a Twitter server and it could have its own name, not a Twitter server technically, but but a Twitter like thing, and people could create accounts on it. But there could be another Twitter like thing that it's almost like um, more like email is is probably a good way for most people to picture it. It's like you can sign up on Gmail, you can sign up on Microsoft, you can sign up on your company thing, and they all they all talk to each other. So you could do something like Twitter or where where it's more of an open protocol that anyone can can play and um in theory you could do that with with the blockchain and with with um what people generally call web3 technologies um I'll, and it's interesting i mean i think that my take on that is a lot of the very the most ardent supporters of decentralization 
in the context of something like Twitter are, they're not necessarily focused on the most interesting part of it, in my opinion, i.e. there's people who want to create an uncensorable Twitter or uncensorable social network to make it so no one can ever be removed. Um, you know, there's no central authority and wherever you fall on the censorship line, I personally don't think that's the biggest problem to solve. But what it does enable is potentially whole new takes on on the experience, the discovery algorithms, the all, all kinds of things that could be extended um, would be possible with a decentralized model without losing the network effect. I think that's potentially interesting. And so I do hope that they'll they'll explore that. You talked about this on, on John Stewart's show uh, a while back um, in decentralization in terms of content moderation. And you brought up the censorship issue. You said, mm -hmm. what's the Twitter that no one owns? Uh, that can't be controlled centrally. It's not clear why that wouldn't be more anarchy and chaos. Can you also decentralize moderation? Uh, can mm -hmm. you say, is your concern there yeah. that if there's a whole bunch of different Twitters um, and then no one is actually watching what happens on those Twitters and no one's able to like kick people off or, or moderate content, then we could have all kinds of problems that we were trying to solve by decentralizing in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're going for. Some people see the ability to censor it all on Twitter as a bug and that that's things needs to be fixed and there's alternatives to Twitter like Parler and you know a whole host of them who when Trump was kicked off rose up and was like here's the we're the free speech platform and I don't know if you've dipped your toes into those but those are just cesspools yeah they're not great <laughs> so, bad, bad places I mean but I don't know maybe some people like him and look like you can go hang out with your friends i don't i don't think it should be illegal or anything to to talk and have bad ideas but if you want to create something that's useful and more inviting for uh, a broader swath of society then i think some management of of norms and rules and and behaviors is helpful yeah. put it that way so in a decentralized world that could happen. Keep it. You could you could sign up for the the gated Twitter that's very you know curated and moderated, and you could sign up for anarchy Twitter, or you could do something in between. That maybe that's maybe that's cool. Maybe that's useful, and maybe maybe it's even inevitable. And if you look at other systems like Telegram or some of the messaging systems, that's kind of what you have. You have your your groups you opt into. And different rules apply, even Reddit, you know, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, one person who's been pushing decentralization and less content moderation is uh, the company's newest board member and now largest shareholder, uh, Elon Musk, who just recently criticized Twitter for too much content moderation and failing to adhere to free speech principles. What do you think about that criticism from Elon? Um, I don't know exactly what he's referring to. Um so I don't know. I mean, it, and I actually don't know. I'm not even de defending Twitter. I'm not like saying that he's right or wrong. I actually don't know. Um, I'm not, despite this conversation talking about, about Twitter, I don't even think about Twitter every day. <laughs> so lots of controversy. I just, I just don't opt in to a lot of these conversations. Um, and so maybe he's right. Maybe they've overstepped their bounds, but um I, I haven't observed that, and I I don't think it's a major problem. Like I said a minute ago, I do think um, if you host an environment where people are come together, whether that's you know a party or a discussion forum, um, setting some some guardrails, I think improves that environment, especially if it's online and there is incentive um, and little downside to being a bad actor. It's, it can, you know, peeing in the pool is not cool. So let's have a rule that you can't pee in the pool is, is kind of the way I look at it. Mm. And if someone else has a, has like pee is cool pool, it's like, okay, you can go play in that pool and people can choose what pool to play in is, is my tip. What was your reaction to, uh, to Elon becoming not only a passive investor, but now a seemingly very active investor who's on the board? <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's interesting. I'm like, I'm, 
I'm very impressed with what Elon has done in the world and his approach to PR and tweeting and everything else. He's, he's fascinating. I'm, you know, I'm fascinated like, like anyone else. Um, I appreciate what he's doing with Tesla. I have a Tesla. Hope to go to Mars someday. <laughs> I have, is he good for Twitter? I don't know. Here's, I think, you know, it had it been a few years ago when I was on the board, like really pushing for, for more change and evolution, I would say, great. We have a very bold technologist on the board. That's what we need more of. Um, to, let's, let's, you know, push for some more innovation. Is that what it'll do? I have no idea. I think it'll be, it'll be fascinating. It'll make the board meetings more interesting. And I also know, have friends who are very, very concerned and I respect those concerns. Um, I think it's a little, little too early to tell. It would be, who knows how Elon even has time to pay attention to, to Twitter and everything else. Is it a passing fancy? Um, we'll see. He certainly mastered the attention economy himself uh, uh, being on yeah. Twitter. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you were uh, once a board member and once the largest single shareholder of Twitter. Do you have any advice for Elon as a, as a new board member? <laughs> Uh, I can't possibly think of advice that, that, that I would have for Elon, but, um, interested, interested to see, see what he, uh, what he does. It, but I mean, I think the thing for everyone else to know is as a former biggest shareholder, Twitter and board member, you can't dictate mm. what the company does. And, um, I think people get con- confused about that. It was like, yeah, they, they invited him on, onto the board. He, perhaps could have forced his way onto the board if he took an activist investor uh, path like other board members did. Um, and, but he's one of 12 people on the board and boards actually don't, can't do that. They're not making decisions uh, about details. Boards do not decide much other than should we, you know, who is the CEO? That's right. the main thing boards decide. Do you think Donald Trump should be let back on Twitter if he runs again? <laughs> nah. I mean, right. <laughs> if it was up to me, then nah. Twitter seemed to get better when he I uh, think so. He I left, think so. Didn't it? I mean, I think he definitely left a mark. Uh, on t- Twitter, just as he left sure. a mark on politics and left a mark on media, right? Like he has left a mark that we are still, I admit, a lot of people might say it's more than a mark that we're all still grappling with. But I do think, um, you know, I do think Twitter has felt a little better without him on it. Uh, I sometimes worry that much like we were having this discussion about what happens when people aren't on Twitter and they're on parlor. Donald Trump is now in sort of a closed information ecosystem on the right where he still yeah. gets enough attention on the right and there's still a Republican primary. So whether he gets attention from all of us, it matters little in terms of winning a Republican primary. So I do I do think that. But I don't I don't think I don't think he should be left back on. I mean, he was there was a reason he was kicked off just because now he's getting more attention to take power again. That That's why he should yeah. get more power and amplification. It doesn't seem like a good uh, a good rule. Yeah, I I agree, but I, I mean, my my answer is somewhat politically motivated. I don't want to give him a voice, but I I could see an argument why he should. Um, I could also see arguments like the the violation he you know he he was causing harm in a way that we we did not want to enable, and that's uh that there's I don't know if there's rules around there's a like he served his time or something in, in Twitter jail and we should let him back on. But I I wouldn't be for it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned how you don't think about Twitter all the time. What are your social media habits these days? How how online are you? I'm kind of weird. Well, I, I really i am sporadic about Twitter. I think I t- tweeted more in the last couple of days than I did in the last month. Um, I, I read Twitter, big consumer, very rare tweeter. Um, and I don't use Instagram. I have an account. I'll post a picture of my kids like once every six months. Um, prefer Visco to Instagram. Um, and no, no other social media. Well, as mentioned before, I have checked out TikTok. The it's 
that's barely social media. I think that's, that's entertainment. Yeah. And, um, I spend a lot of time reading <laughs> and I read a lot on medium. I read other things. I mean, there's so much great writing. And to me, that's, I read a lot of books. Um, that's my media consumption is generally, uh, not of the social variety. Um, but, uh, Twitter would, would, you know, not surprisingly be my, my number one social media. Do you feel like that's improved your, your mental health, your happiness being on, being online less? Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. I, I really don't like the feeling of being in Twitter debates in Mm. particular. (laughs) I hate, I just hate it. And so even when I tweet, I don't even look at the replies because, you know, there's always just some asshole. And I was like, I don't need that. So I don't really, I don't really bother. Um, And, and it's just, it's not what I'm, I'm interested in spending my time doing. I don't find it that rewarding to, um, but I do find it rewarding to uh, reading Twitter and learning about things and, um, you know, following people and finding ideas and links. And I love that. Like I'll like consume information, uh, write things, but just as being part of the f- flow and being, you know, out there and looking at my number, I don't, I don't get, I don't get a lot out of that. Yeah. Never read your mentions. Uh, last question I ask all my guests, what's your favorite way to unplug and how often do you get to do it? Uh, I unplug quite a bit. Um, a major unplug would be to go to Hawaii. Yeah, that's a good with, one. With with the family, more of a daily unplug is is just hanging with my kids. I have ten and twelve year old boys, and I don't know. I try to get them to go for a hike. And we have all these great trails right by us. It's rare to get them out there, but I, that would rank very highly. Yeah, it's a good one. Ev Williams, uh, thank you for joining offline. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, John. Take care.